Try to wake everybody up. Good lunch. So I have the pleasure of inviting an esteemed panel of CIOs and strategy leaders. So this is a great opportunity here from the business side. We've talked quite a bit about technology all morning. We've talked about models. We've talked about the risk. On a positive note, hopefully we talk about the benefits of AI and how customers are looking to leverage AI into production. So with that, I'd like to invite first maybe Larry for you to come up, Larry Hamlin. He's a senior partner with McKinsey. All right, please join us. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, sir. Next, I have Michelle Horn, uh, Chief Strategy Officer for Delta Airlines. Michelle, we had a great conversation last yep. night. Looking Absolutely. forward to continuing. Thank you. I have Swami Kochalakota, Chief Digital Solution Officer at SNP Global. Swami is also on our board, so I've known him for a while, so look, look forward to talk, chatting with him. And Marco is no stranger here. So Marco, welcome back uh, to the panel. Yeah. Thank you. So team, you know, since 2022, with ChatGPT, that really popularized the whole LLM Gen AI revolution in many ways. Uh, we've now seen people move from, what well, we heard all day today, from tinkering, experimentation, to starting to move things into production. Uh, Rama was talking about how NVIDIA is using it across the board in engineering, et cetera, right? Uh, we did a survey. We surveyed the IA winners as well as some of the CIOs. And we asked them, what are the challenges moving from pilot prototyping to production? And we heard basically three themes uh, that I'll kind of categorize. And hopefully we'll spend a little bit of time using that as a guide. But you're open to answering any of these other topics you may have as you talk through this. The three themes we heard was one about data. I mean, I personally had trying to build an AI agent for our, our platform. And we're realizing how bad our data is, right? So data quality, data security, data privacy, indemnification rights, IP rights, lawsuits. Like, there's a swath of things I'll put in the category of data. That's one. Second we, we heard was talent, right? Uh, we can't have enough talent to throw at, at the problem and the demand. We talked about that last night over dinner as well. And the third thing is just integrating into the business workflow or the integration with my enterprise systems. Uh, those are kind of the three key themes. And, and to add to that, I would say what I hear from many of my customers, I come from the business value side uh, of Aptio, is how do I justify the cost? Right? So is the ROI there? Is the impact there? So I would say that the fourth one is really, are you able to tie this to business impact? How are you business justifying? And given the audience has a whole bunch of entrepreneurs here, I think I'll, I'll leave a last question in terms of, you know, what are the problems that, you know, they, are, they should be selling you? And how would they approach a CIO? Because I know many of the startups I worked with, they always say, how do I address the customer? How do I get them to take my call? So maybe we'll leave that at the end for many of the entrepreneurs here in terms of uh, from leveraging it. So let's start, maybe I'll start with you, Marco. You know, in July of, uh, of this year, <coughs> Goldman Sachs announced your AI platform. Yeah. I had a chance to listen to some of your podcasts. And, and you said, you know, on an average 10 to 20%, uh, of developer productivity was one of the areas you kind of in, invested in early on around using a Gen AI code assistant. Maybe I'll, I'll have you talk a little bit about the approach that Goldman Sachs is taking from an AI platform perspective. You know, you're taking a platform approach. We've talked quite a bit about that. Maybe start there. Uh, how are you starting to think about getting uh, from pilot to production using a platform approach? Yeah, so AJ, thanks. Uh, I think it's a very uh, broad question. So first of all, we started from the realization, and I think it's actually true today as much as it was uh, in a couple of years ago, that there are many more things that we don't know about AI than those that we know. Okay? We are starting to form some uh, uh, convictions, and I think I'm using the word conviction because I don't want to use the word certainty because there is no certainty, almost like you know, uh, uh, intrinsic in the model. Um, and, and I think in a case where you have uh, uh, a large amount of ambiguity, but at the same time, uh, you know, you're in this quadrant where it's like maximum ambiguity, maximum potential. Um, I think the thing to do is uh, to kind of create a way for uh, our people to do experimentation in a way that is safe and compliant, okay? The worst thing that can happen, especially to a bank, is that someone could, will start, uh, you know, like, opening up accounts in various uh, you know, AI providers and then kind of trusting what comes back and then that thing goes uh, you know, t you know, in, in, <coughs> in the hands of clients. That just cannot happen. And so what we decided to do was uh, uh, 
you know, let's almost like uh, create a containment layer around uh, these models. It's almost like we're dealing with, uh, you know, with something really powerful that potentially uh, uh, um, problematic. And so it's like a containment, like a reactor containment, where we implement a bunch of safeties uh, around the models, around uh, obviously uh, infiltration, exfiltration of data, uh, protecting against hallucination, grounding with uh, our own sources of data, and also routing the right content to the right model. Also to become model independent in a way. And then on top of that, uh, you know, basically standardize some of the techniques such as chain of thought uh, um, or retrigger generation so that uh, developers will not really have to think about the how. Uh, um, because that's largely, it's a lot of, you know, like, uh, in a way, lots of tricks and a lot of things that kind of, you know, you do to, to improve the effectiveness of those tools that uh, you just want a learning, you, you don't want to repeat the learning curve for every application. And then on top of that, putting a, a sort of a rapid application development uh, layer. With that, we were able to, um, and through a sort of an internal governance to try to really understand where to, where to focus, we were able to create a, dozens of POCs, uh, and out of that, we emerged with four main use cases, which, which is where we're, we're deciding to invest now on areas such as developer productivity, document management, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of a banker copilot, uh, so to speak, uh, et cetera. I'm not going to go into the details, but kind of the approach has been, uh, you know, bottom up, top down with a containment, which will allow us to in a way, let the creativity unfold <laughs> um, and really trying to minimize uh, uh, sort of the downsides of that. So you started by allowing a lot more uh, experimentation across the organization and with this containment layer. Yeah. But then I'm assuming at some point you had to choose which of these you want to put That's into right. production. That's right. And so you have a governance process of sorts where you We do have an absolutely governance process. Uh, we have created like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, groups of people like committees, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's a word that is used uh, in our environment. But, you know, kind of getting a good mix of people, business and technology, et cetera, that will, you know, look at, uh, form, first of all, a measurement, uh, and then form an ROI a hypothesis, and then, uh, you know, eventually validate what, what gets funding. I think, you know, like in general, and I'll, I'm not going to go very long on this one, but I mean, we see kind of three waves of ROI and the type of investment. One is kind of the wave zero, where you can kind of adopt something out of the box uh, and you don't have to invest too much in customization. An example of that is the code completion and, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of a uh, out of the box developer stuff. There is, and that one is pretty easy to get to positive ROI because you know if I'm spending 30 bucks a month uh, on, a, on, a, on a developer license, uh, that's essentially like you know, I don't know, like a few minutes of extra productivity in a way. <laughs> um, the wave two is when you actually start to integrate with the company's data sources, etc. So you have a little bit of a J curve, and then the wave three is when you're really creating you know like you know models for specific tasks uh, where. Uh, you're betting that there's going to be a return. Things like trading or things like portfolio management. You call it the high alpha in your, in your conversation. Bit. Alpha stuff, exactly. which has obviously intrinsically a deeper J curve. And then you need to navigate your strategy around those three waves. Excellent. Uh, maybe I'll switch over to you, Swami. I mean, you are in a very data rich environment, S&P Global, and you've also made some good acquisitions recently, et cetera. Maybe broadly speaking, how are you looking at your AI strategy? And again, I'll, I'll bias it towards you know, what I call responsible AI. Yeah. And also talk a little bit about that. So maybe give us a little bit more color from your side. Yeah, sense. our AI strategy has like three pillars. The first one is from an employee productivity perspective. What can we do? I think you heard a lot about developer productivity, analyst productivity, you know, the ROI, you know, is a little bit black and white, if you will, um, for, for the most part. Uh, and some technologies we get to invest and some technologies we try to build because we don't want to pay for that upfront cost. So that's like the first uh, aspect of our uh, AI strategy. And the second one, which is the most important one, is um, you know, where is the new revenue coming from? Right? At the end of the day, we as public company have to figure out where is the revenue coming from. So the second pillar of our strategy is that what are the new net revenue growth opportunities? And the third one is you know, AI, you know, from a defensive move perspective, where do you have to be? Because you just, you know, customers expect you to provide that search service and all that, right? So that's the core pillars of our strategy. 
much like Mark has mentioned, we have a good decision tree around where to invest. Because there isn't any business process that I know of where AI cannot enhance. Uh, but the question really is, which process do you want to invest in, whether it's a productivity, and if it, in the case of new revenue growth, uh, how do you work with the customer, and what is your go-to market strategy for that customer for the new revenue growth, right? Is customer willing to pay for it? Because what's a lot going on with these co-pilots and agenting things is that who is paying for it, right? It's very important, so uh, that's an important question. To your second point, you know, you had to understand that generative AI is a probabilistic result. You know, we are used to calculators and computing that is analytical, that is deterministic uh, answers. Every time you want to ask a question, you get the same answers in the deterministic computing. So in the, because the generative AI by nature is probabilistic and statistical, you will have you know, hallucinations, right? And then the way we are trying to solve the problem is uh, restricting, the, restricting it to the data and the context that we give in so that we minimize the hallucinations. I think this whole ethical AI and hallucinations has a long roadmap. We're just at the tip of the iceberg on that. Wonderful. Uh, maybe I'll move over uh, to you, uh, Michelle. You, know, you and I were speaking, uh, Delta Airlines clearly Every one of us is a consumer, right? And we talked about uh, the experience. And most of you are flyers here, uh, absolutely Thank uh, you get for that. touched one way or the other, right? <laughs> With an airline. And so I think you had a really nice framework you were talking about in terms of how you think about what AI means for an airline like Delta. Uh, maybe from a customer, I mean, we've always talked about chatbots, customer services are really a low hanging fruit, like that and GNA function. And I think you were talking about how we would start looking from a customer service perspective. Maybe give the team a little bit of a view of. How's Delta looking at, and in your strategy role, right? Yeah. You have a great role, you buy planes on one side and you're looking at AI on the other side. It's a pretty broad spectrum yeah. of, of a charter. So maybe uh, a little bit more color in terms of how do you think about AI from a Delta Airlines perspective? Sure, and um, thank you for having me and um, really happy to be here. I think we are very much about connecting the world and we think AI is a big part of that. So um, we think about it, actually I, I like Marco's um, Three as well, because I think the way we think about it would parallel that. There is um, a lot that we've talked a lot about today already about developer productivity and things like, like that. Um, but then the two other big ones for us, there is one, we think about the customer side and we think about the operation. And those are a little different. On the, on the customer side, you know, customers are looking for what is an elevated, caring, experience that is increasingly seamless. And so anything that we can do to get information in the hands of our customers, that means that they can do what they want to do as quickly as possible and fly through, um, fly through their journey, we are at. Right now, for us, that's a lot about putting information in the hands of our, our people to support that. And I think as uh, models get more capable and as we get more, more confident, then, um, then I think we'll be increasingly wanting to be more direct to the customer themselves and also, I think, more proactive. And you know, the kinds of things that we think about can be as simple as when do you need to leave the Sky Club to get to the plane to you know, can, I, can I take my pet bird if I'm flying to Mexico? Like these, these are all questions that you know, have a very specific answer that AI is really well, well suited to, to do. Um, and for us, we have you know, 25 million SkyMiles members who I, we very much appreciate. Some are on this stage, lots are in this room and other places. And uh, being able to serve you in a way that reflects that we know you and we know what you care about is, is Personalization. What we're Personalization is what we're, yeah. Absolutely. Um, on the operation side, it's a little more, it's more complicated, certainly. But just to think about for a minute um, an airline to get you to where you want to go on time about 10 things have to happen really well 5,400 times a day. And that is really, that we're an industry that is made for the power of AI and making that happen. And you, know, you can think about things like the crew, the incoming plane, um, the maintenance, the bags, the connecting passengers, the weather, the air traffic control routes, the gates, like all these things need to come together pretty pretty seamlessly. And it you know, speaks to, I think, the power of our team and what they do to make us an on-time airline 
since all those things don't go right every time. But, but for us, what AI can do to help them is, um, is really exciting. That is a longer road, and, but one that has real potential. I think for many of the folks sitting in the room, as you start to speak to the business, you notice no one talked about models. Mm -hmm. No one talked about the how. They're all talking about business problems they need to solve. And who better than McKinsey who gets to sit across? I mean, and I was talking to Larry. We, we use McKinsey pretty heavily at IBM, and we use a stat from McKinsey. And I said, Larry, be, care, be, re be ready for this. We've talked about anywhere from, what is three to $5 trillion added to the GDP because of AI. And there's a fairly rich document McKinsey's written uh, in terms of how they see this productivity gain is going to drive the economies. Yeah. Just for reference, uh, the UK economy is $3.1 trillion. So you're basically going to add the corner of a UK economy through AI productivity in the years to come, with these thousands of apps or millions of apps being built to assistance. So maybe from your side, Larry, you know, as you look at this and you get to work with a lot of the customers, what's your perspective in terms of where are we in this, uh, this uh, excitement? I see a lot of experimentation still. You see people moving. So maybe start by calibrating from your side. You know, what's the maturity? Uh, where are we in this journey of, of uh, hype to to yeah. reality in some ways. Right? I think it's a great tee up, uh, AJ. So let's stay on that five trillion figure, right? Because it's a mind blowing figure. So world economy is 100 trillion, right? So what we're saying is that in the next five years or so, we can actually add 5% to the world economy through pure AI. Of course, there's other effects as well. Then you ask, what does it mean for you guys? Just to stay with that figure. Our estimate currently is that that five becomes roughly 500 billion. So one tenth in terms of revenues that you can capture. You meaning technology companies. So that's new software and Gen AI TAM coming into the market. And now we come to the question, AJ, that like, how do you capture that? You're all entrepreneurs. Well, I think the past technology waves are a good proxy to how this technology wave will play out. And if I may use Delta as an example, I as a Delta customer will not pay Delta more no matter what they do with Gen AI. I might be more loyal, right? And maybe, you know, I will buy a meal because you make a better recommendation, but I will not pay more. That story has played out now time and time after again. So if we look at early waves of digitalization, if we look at like cloud transition, 90% of the benefits of that 5 trillion are productivity benefits. And we come to the question then why we haven't moved yet to at scale mm -hmm deployment, and I think you made a great point around the operations. When a company like Delta has to deploy this to thousands of flights per day, tens of thousands of people, millions of customers, simply the maturity has not been there yet. And I think we all heard and we all knew that ChatGPT came out 22 months ago. And yes, we had GPT-3 and others before, but the deployment, the reliability at the scale, large scale enterprises require it hasn't been there yet. I think we're actually on the onset of us getting to a meaningful place, but we're just entering that era. And that's, I think, one of the biggest drivers. And that's the challenge any enterprise has, that can I really deploy this? Even if I believe in the potential, do we have credible case examples? That's the first question an enterprise asks. Then they will ask you, OK, show me the proof of value. Show actually what is the production type of environment where you're running your tech. And, and those cases, I think, are very critical for any enterprise customer. And I think we're just getting there now. So Marco, I, I'll turn it back to you, my friend. Uh, you heard quite a bit around this potential that's there. And you talked quite elegantly this morning about how you're starting to see. And I, I love the fact that you're, you know, most of the Gen AI capability is more an assistant type capability today. And we talk quite a bit with this agentic infrastructure and where things are going to move from assistance to action. You know, as you look at uh, the financial industries, so usually cutting edge, the leading the pack in many of these cases. How do you see this evolution playing out? And, and are you seeing the ROI beyond some of the more, you know, assistant capability like code gen, et cetera, that you're starting to see? Like, how are you starting to scale this beyond the initial you know, domain or function, are you seeing a broad adoption and are you seeing this moving more and more beyond assistance to kind of an action-oriented organization? It's kind of a rough timeline if you were kind of putting an hourglass in terms of how do you see this maturing over time, right? I think the, the headline is uh, when uh, you're go we're going to be in a position where we can actually 
specify an outcome and then letting the AI figure, figure out how to get there. Right now, it's very much hand-holding because you need to you know, essentially interact step by step and kind of guide the AI there. A lot of the use cases that work today, like for example, um, you know, we have an M&A use case where uh, you have uh, all the M&A de documents that we've, uh, that we've uh, you know, created over the years uh, uh, um, connected to an AI to which you can ask uh, very complex questions around, for example, which companies have had, uh, uh, you know, like M&A uh, on a specific sector where the final price was lower than the first price and this following, uh, you know, like uh, other criteria are inserted. And, and then you kind of have to continually refine uh, uh, step by step. Where we want to get is a point where you can actually define an outcome. For example, I take your non-financial services, but very relevant for my engineering team. Let's migrate from Java 8 to Java 21. And I have this 100 applications. And there are tons of dependencies, because obviously Java 21 requires uh, all the other components to be upgraded. And the outcome should be the following. And uh, you know, we want a certain percentage of our process being migrated. So we just tell, tell you what the end result is going to be. And then an agent will actually start a long-running task that will involve other agents, it will involve all humans, it will actually involve humans on demand. Mm -hmm. And AI will say, Marco, or an engineer, please do this for me. It's kind of reversing the, the exactly. paradigm. We have an incredibly the complex- The actors from the human to the automation, and Absolutely. the human's there for checking. Absolutely, and uh, we have a, you know, an example like we have uh, uh, extremely complex scenarios that we go through. For example, when we calculate uh, a, a portfolio rebalancing, okay? You know, something happens or a, a company exits, for example, the S&P 500, we need to rebalance it, or uh, there are certain world events, etc. That's a long, uh, you know, job that can take days. Uh, and uh, the outcome specified could be, okay, give me a new portfolio that, for example, contains more ESG companies and less uh, uh, international exposure and perfectly tracks the S&P 500, and, and, go. And then uh, that starts a series of tasks. And then, you know, like the agent works uh, with the company and the data and at their fingertips. So it's kind of the three levers that the agent has is the data, access to the data, access to people, and access to other AIs. And that kind of, that's, that's where we see the 10x advantage. Right now we're talking about, uh, we're here, I mean, listen, look, how many AIs, comp how, how, how many conferences have I been in the last two years? Uh, I don't know, say 100. How many of them were, how many of them were uh, AI-centric? Maybe 100 and one. <laughs> Maybe more. More than the ones that, 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 that are. And so all this cannot be 10% improvement in productivity exactly. of developers. Come on, it can't be. It needs to be 10x. So the, the interactive hand-holding part uh, is the 10x, the outcome-based automatic part uh, where the AI is gonna go for a one-week journey to save you three years of work, that's the 10x part. And that's really where we're gonna see the real ROI. So I think maybe to, to uh, either one of you, uh, Swami, et cetera, is, is how do you get there, right? Where are you today? I mean, you paint a great vision, Marco, right? We all wanna get to this fully automated reverse where the automation leads, humans are validating and being supported and pulled in. We want to flip the equation. There's a big social impact to that. We won't even get to that for now. For now. But how do you get on the journey and what do you do from an infrastructure? Swami, so, mean, you and I talk quite about infrastructure. Like what, what is the foundation you need to put in place to get there? Yeah. I mean, much like uh, when we talked about the co-pilots, uh, you have to have the data ready and your employees and the talent has to be there. So I would like to think that uh, a lot of the companies like us have solved that problem. Right? We invested over the last two years, uh, or last one and a half years on this, I feel pretty good. I think with this agentic thing, there are, there are two things that I would say. The, the first and foremost, um, the prerequisite for you to take advantage of this agentic uh, architecture and the vision that uh, Mark has just shared, you have to have the right process under the hood. So, you know, at SMP Global, for example, from the lead comes in through our Adobe CDP system, 
and how do we market qualify it so that it goes into sales for some lead and to actually book it uh, into the GL. And all that process uh, is very, very clear. So now what I can do is that um, with the agentic vision, I could do some process mining on what are the opportunities and where I would flip and where I would still have human at the front. So that's the, the biggest opportunity. And the second thing that I would also say that get, not getting a lot of attention, but from an enterprise perspective, I see a lot of value is, um, is this notion that uh, AI is the new UI. Because in the enterprises, um, there is a lot of old technology. And in order for you to solve a problem, if you have to go through technical that and integrate them, thinking about all these edge cases in UI, you know, it's a waste of time. Now I can put an AI front end in front of multiple applications and create a new workflow because I don't have to worry about those edge cases. So, so those two are, to me, are the foundational, having the right process engineering background, um, if you have a good foundation. And second thing is this concept that uh, AI is the UI and how you can overlay. Excellent. Uh, Michelle, from your side, you and I talked about talent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, we're not a Facebook, we're not a Meta, right? Or, or we're not a Google or one of these exciting companies. And, and you're recruiting for talent because you're more traditional airline industry. Like you and I talked yeah, about this, totally. right? This is a challenge. Totally. Uh, Atlanta is, you're not trying to recruit from Seattle or, 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 or the Bay Area. So. I'm totally open to it. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I think the question then really is, how does a traditional industry who has to now digitize and leverage AI look about to recruit and build talent? So what's your strategy yeah. for the talent challenge that we talked about, both in terms of the demand you have, yeah. as well as how do you start to go recruit and build out the talent gap that we talked about? Um, it's a really, really good topic. Uh, I think for us there are three things. Uh, one, we have to prioritize pretty ruthlessly. Right. There are way more ideas than anything that we are going to be, you know, that we, we could do. So um, a lot of time is spent on where are the really big opportunities that we want to lean in with, with the resources that we do have. The second one is partners. We partner a lot. That has been a path to speed for us, and that is definitely something that we will um, continue where we can. So far, that has been a lot on the customer-facing side. Um, the most part, and um, I think I had a, a third one is just exposure of our teams. We are pretty intentional in trying to make sure that every experience that we do have, um, we are sharing across our teams and developing our own talent, and that is a, a stream in and of itself that we don't really want to leave just to, no. to chance. So those those are the three big things that we do. I think we are. Benefiting from, you know, it's a, there's some really interesting problems and people like to work on these problems and so that works to our advantage, but those are the three things we go for. No, I think it's great, right? I think one of the things we're all finding out that we have to incubate the talent in many ways. And we gotta enrich the talent with the domain. So one of the things I'm finding in my business as a product team is I'm great product managers, but they're not practitioners. And a lot of the, this is really a data problem, and not a capability problem, because we spend so much time on feature function at the heart of a data. And so trying to bring the practitioner for the training, for, for the modeling, the, the tagging, is really a difference. So you have to somehow marry business context or business knowledge with the technologists and the data science team we're standing up, so great point. Swami, so, mean, I, I know you and I have talked quite a bit about this notion around security and privacy and being a financial company and, and particularly providing information. How are you looking at this whole idea of security, privacy, or, or governance broadly, I'll call it? Uh, I mean, it's a work in progress, right? I, was, I think the analogy that I would give from a security perspective is uh, when the internet came in, we were only thinking at that time just the firewalls, right? Nothing else, right? But now to protect you from all the threats that are out there, you need to have uh, you know, application scanning technology, right? web application firewalls. right? Uh, so there's a lot more layers uh, that you need to have. So right now what we're seeing is uh, just we have a guardrails technology that we use. Effe effectively, there are prompts that will guide your uh, model to what to say and what not to say. right? So, but that guardrails technology is very, very early. So 
Um, there's hopefully there'll be a lot more innovation. So every answer that I give to my customers, I have to show the lineage of where I came with the answer, and I also have to be consistent, right? So for us, we are a little bit protected because I could restrict it and say, hey, I gave you this answer uh, or this insight, and that's because of these four sources uh, has been very helpful. But this whole AI ethics um, and uh, the truth uh, has a lot more innovation. And I would also say one more thing. Uh, if you look at all the solutions that are out there, and if you put them against a benchmark, you know, we at benchmarks.kensho.com, one of the properties that we have, for the financial industry, we created a benchmark on what is the success. And if I look at all the models, the best model is only 90% successful. So for, I think the art of the possible is around how do you take that 90 to 100%, and in that process, you are actually making it less hallucinative and more, more clear, and it also solves some of the other ethical and privacy-related issues that you have as well. As far as uh, maybe from a broader customer and market perspective, what are you seeing as some of these challenges? How are customers leveraging McKinsey and your capability to help move from this initial experimentation production? Do you have a framework, an approach? Yeah, we do. Um, let me start with the challenges first. So, so what is the challenge? And maybe I build uh, on, on you, Swami, a bit. So you talked about workflows and process, right? In order to apply Gen AI, what we need to do is to reimagine the workflow. Workflow being a set of processes or process across an enterprise. You might be surprised, but most companies actually do not have professionals who can in a credible way think that if, if we work like this today, what could it be as a, based on Gen AI three years from now or five years from now? That's a capability that is very much in lacking. That's challenge number one, that we don't have people who actually across domains can think of these workflows. Second is an engineering challenge. Not an LLM challenge or a challenge with transformers, but engineering challenge. So when we bring a solution, most of the processes today are extremely customized in an enterprise. You probably, even if you use up, let's say in IT operations, you use ServiceNow, you're gonna have a customized instance or a customized instance of Salesforce. Meaning whenever we apply technology to those workflows, who's actually gonna do that? And how do we build then the transformer-based the solutions there? Uh, third challenge I see is data and APIs. I think we talked a lot about data today. Data in enterprises is scattered, it's not up to date. You know, even if we have the best tech, you know, we might not actually get the data in. And it's also APIs. The system landscape, you know, if we look at cloud penetration today, I think it's globally 15%, right? 15. That means 85% of systems are running on-prem and they're legacy systems. So how do you actually have proper APIs, pro proper system access? even if we have the per perfect agentic framework and agents. But the final challenge, I, I, I think, AJ, is, uh, is leadership. And the reason I mention that is that out of all the changes, McKinsey used to study that how many transformations fail. And we used to be historically say that constantly that 70% of every transformation fails. Gen AI is, by the way, a transformation. Five years ago, we did the same benchmark with cloud that failure percentage had increased from 70 to 86. So actually the success rate had less than half, from 30 to 14%, right? That's a challenge with leadership. It's a challenge with, like, where do we find leaders who are able to both kind of at the same time vision how their company might look in the future, but in a very pragmatic way then do things that lead towards that vision. And I think that would be my like, guidance and I think guiding thought for you as entrepreneurs or VCs that my like, I worked during my career in McKinsey the last 20 years with about 100 companies. 50% of leaders you should just forget about, sorry to say, like enterprise leaders. And the reason is that they don't understand that tech deep enough what you guys are trying to do at, from your position. 40% of leaders care, but they don't necessarily have the means to act at that point. 10% of leaders are willing to act and really try it if you can show the proof of value. So the question for you guys all here in the audience, how do you find your 10% and how do you show them the proof of value to build trust and use your company's tech or your portfolio company's tech? I'll do a rapid fire to leave five minutes for questions. Uh, if you had to give one set of advice in terms of an ROI or the business impact of AI, uh, as you're starting to look at your priorities for this year, what is an area that you think has the biggest impact from an AI perspective that any of these companies can look to, to pitch you? So 
one area that you would say, this is an area of priority for me. Here's where I can see tremendous ROI. Uh, what would you guide uh, the team here on? Is it customer success? Is it more R&D? Is it engineering, right? Is it supply chain? We heard across the board. Uh, again, we vary by industry, but is there a theme here that you would say, this is here and now, this is what you should focus on in terms of driving business impact? Do you want to start, Michelle? Okay. Um, today, customer support. Okay. Yeah, I would say uh, our business, we measure a lot on NPS, Net Promoter Score, so anything that would drive that NPS uh, up, uh, which includes customer success and go-to-market, is, is an opportunity for us. Right, so top-line customer facing. Marco, for you, engineering still, or would you look beyond engineering? Well, now? I think, you know, like, uh, you have two, two dimensions. I think I'll give you a, a, a frame of mind rather than a direct end. If this is about making people more efficient, efficient it's pretty broad. Yeah. focus uh, on uh, where you have lots of people that are actually quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> because if you focus on people that are expensive and you have 10 of them, probably it's not a great place to start. Or, you know, like where you have 10,000 people that are, you know, all outsourced and they're paid very, very little. So who's on the inter in intersection of a lot and very expensive? And I guess that's why developers is probably the best, the best uh, you know, we have 17,000 out of 45,000 people or something like that, including contracts, so 12,000 employees. Uh, and, and, you know, developers are paid well, and they're also not, not only paid well, but are also a scarce resource. And so I think you need to start uh, where you can see, like, uh, you know, where you have uh, uh, the most bang for the buck. It's pretty clear. No, great point. Or is there anything from your perspective? I'm mostly thinking I'm going to hire Mark of the McKinsey, so uh, <laughs> the framework he just showed up is such a great one. O on a serious note, I, I love the points that came out here. I would add one thing that we used to have RPA, right? I think what we're seeing as McKinsey is that low complexity, human in the loop tasks, sorry, I'm generalizing now a lot, will be the next to go. So traditionally we used to apply RPA. I think we see like the next gen form of RPA, which is a hybrid between traditional automation as well as gen AI driven kind of break, task breakdowns, automatic uh, implementations, et cetera. That will, that, that will come in addition to customer success and what Marcus said. Excellent. We have probably time for one or two questions. Anybody have a question? There are a couple here. So the questions for, for the folks who are on large software teams, obviously we all see the advantage of Copilot and that's call it, you know, approach one. We see RPA, call it approach two. Low code, probably that same category. And we're starting to see those software agents that can uh, do more complex software tasks in the, in the core product or maybe internal tools and whatnot. Um, where do you see it's heading? Um, uh, and if there's like percentage distribution for those and how this is gonna change over time and why? I can, I can take a stab at it. See, look, I think you have to also understand that a lot of enterprises are actually, developers are actually modifying the existing code a lot, right? You know, when you're talking about uh, new, new, new developers building something new, you could, uh, you know, that belongs to one use case, right? So I think from a, to answer your question on the percentage distribution, it all depends upon are you writing a lot of new code and the number of may vary. If you're making a lot of code for existing changes in a, a feature enhancements, I think we have times to go on being able to fully automate it with agent card. So the answer that the distribution is depends, but uh, like I think what we are unilaterally saying is that developer productivity uh, and what you can do to repurpose is a high use case. For sure. I think the Java upgrade use case is a perfect one we talked about. For example, we call it KTLO, keep, keeping the lights on. As a product organization, my job is to bring the KTLO down and improve the number of engineers working on capability and feature. So KTLO is probably the area we look at the most. Second one is we found that the productivity benefit for onboarding younger, so we hire, you know, we call band fives, band six, getting them productive faster. So a lot of the value we're focusing on is how do we onboard new folks earlier? As we move from high cost to best cost location, how do we bring that training, documentation, simple use case of just documenting code. A lot of the historical is not well documented. So, there's some very pedestrian use cases we're seeing that can drive productivity before even getting to more of the fancy agent RPA automation kind of work. So most of the stuff is very much 
uh, around the KTLO use case, at least in my, my shop. Anything else for anyone else? No? I, I actually do agree with this, absolutely. Yeah, great. There's another question here, sorry, and then we'll yes. have one in the back. Yeah. Uh, so, Michelle, you had just mentioned uh, about customer support and the role AI and AI agents will play in improving that process. Do you believe that AI will ever fully replace the human-to-human problem-solving interaction that, that occurs? I mean, each of you have some form of customer support in place, and, and sometimes it's easier to talk to a human <laughs> to resolve your problems. So curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, I think it depends very much on the nature of the problem. Like, you know, if you take the, just sticking with airlines for a minute, there's a lot of things that I think AI can handle directly. You know, Earl, can I take my bird to Mexico? Um, lots of questions like that. Even, even more changes and th things that happen, AI is going to be able to do. I think there is a... Um, subset of things that there will be some a human doing for a long time. Um, really complicated uh, international itineraries, those kinds of things are things we think about. Um, I also think you know, what that enables at least our people to do is to spend more time with customers on the things they really exactly. want to. So for us, you know, we're trying to take the burden off and just turn our people loose to do what they really want to be doing. So in a product organization, bulk of the work we've been doing, and we've been talking about support deflection for years. I see this as just another capability to drive more support deflection. Deflection meaning we don't have to call a customer support person. You can self-serve, identify a problem. So I see more and more that as a metric, how much of the workload is running back to a support, and more even from support to engineering. I want less people, all the requests coming in. So how can I get my support folks to answer more questions? How do I get the front line? So it's deflection is a metric we already have, and we continue to see how to drive the ROI on that one. The one question. Yeah, hi, Aging. One. Good, good panel. Um, productivity and security has certainly got the board's attention. That's now they're paying attention to uh, AI's impact. In security, cyber resilience has been a term for uh, recovery, protect, and recover. Um, how has AI changed the resilience equation now that you're dealing with all layers of the stack? Anybody else wants to ask? Yeah, I, th I think from a cyber, I mean, the generative AI and AI really is uh, increasing our production levels. You know, the CISO is part of my team. And the amount of uh, no, you know, operational data that we see to sift through what is actually risk uh, has significantly increased with uh, AI. So we're able to protect uh, and detect issues a lot faster and better. Even though you had a lot of these Splunk and other log technologies, you know, we were able to now drive value based upon the you know, threats. I think one of the things we're seeing generally is resiliency is becoming a team across both the whole life cycle, from how you build products, how you deliver products, how you support products. So as you think about digital products and services, resiliency has become an attribute. And so how do you apply Gen AI techniques to drive better resiliency across the life cycle, providing the rich context. So more and more for us, it's about providing personalized context to the persona with incident management or you know, root cause analysis or proactive security management. And then DLP, data leak protection. Uh, I was talking to Rama earlier. You know, that data, the model that you built at NVIDIA, that is your company asset now. If someone gets access to that model with all the IP, that's years of engineering IP that's lost. So more and more, the model becomes the company asset and how do you protect it uh, becomes a big thing. So we're starting to see a lot of areas of data protection uh, and DLP kinds of stuff in terms of who has access to it, where's the data going, do you train it, we're calling some third party SaaS service, and your data shipping out there. Like, those are the kind of real concerns we're seeing as we work with our customers. Great. Well, I want to thank you. This thank is you. team panel. Appreciate the time, and I, hopefully that was valuable. Thank you.